morning, y'all. It's day 26 of the Winter Book at Home Workouts. Um, today's Tuesday, March 5th, and it's a seven day. So, shout out to Gary, uh, the number guys, GG33 on Twitter. But it's a seven day, meaning that um, it's not a day to work out the body, really, it's a day to work out the mind. So, for athletes and most people in general, stretch is okay. But today, I'm gonna just do yoga. Um, I'm gonna do some stretching. I'm gonna use the foam roll, massage gun, do some hip openers. But yeah, this is how we start our day, y'all. This is how we looking right now. Feel me? About to come up on four weeks in on this, so I'm feeling good. But yeah, we just about to continue, continue the series. In conversation. conversation on Columbus. But just then, under the knife, I created the following technique for posterity. I call it Never the Naked City. Technique number 15, Never the Naked City. Whenever someone asks you the inevitable, and where are you from? Never ever unfairly challenge their powers of imagination with a one word answer. Learn some engaging facts about your hometown that conversational partners can comment on. Then when they say something clever in response to your bait, they think you're a great conversationalist. Different bait for shrimp or sharks. A fisherman uses different bait to bag bass or bluefish. And you will obviously throw out different conversational bait to snag simple shrimp or sophisticated sharks. Your hook should relate to the type of person you're speaking with. I'm originally from Washington, D.C. If someone at, say, an art gallery asked me where I was from, I might answer Washington, D.C., designed, you know, by the same city planner who designed Paris. This opens the conversational possibilities to the artistry of city planning, Paris, other cities' plans, European travel, and so forth. At a social party of singles, I'd opt for another answer. I'm from Washington, D.C. The reason I left is there were seven women to every man when I was growing up. Now the conversation can turn to the ecstasy or agony of being single, the perceived lack of desirable men everywhere, or even flirtatious possibilities. In a political group, I cast a current fact from the constantly evolving political face of Washington. No need to speculate on the multitude of conversational possibilities that unlocks. Where did you get your conversational bait? Start by phoning the Chamber of Commerce or Historical Society of your town. Search the World Wide Web and click on your town, or open an old-fashioned encyclopedia. All rich sources for future stimulating conversations. Learn some history, geography, business statistics, or perhaps a few fun facts to tickle future friends' funny bones. The 
The Devlin debacle inspired further research. The minute I got home, I called the Columbus Chamber of Commerce and the Historical Society. Say you too are from Columbus, Ohio, and your new acquaintance lays it on you. Where are you from? When you are talking with a business person, your answer could be, I'm from Columbus, Ohio. You know, many major corporations do their product testing in Columbus because it's so commercially typical. In fact, it's been called the most American city in America. They say if it booms or bombs in Columbus, it booms or bombs nationally. Talking with someone with a German last name? Tell her about Columbus's historic German village with the brick streets and the wonderful 1850s style little houses. It's bound to inspire stories of the old country. Your conversation partner's surname is Italian. Tell him Genoa, Italy is Columbus's sister city. Talking with an American history buff? Tell him that Columbus was indeed named after Christopher Columbus and that a replica of the Santa Maria is anchored in the Scioto River. Talking with a student? Tell her about the five universities in Columbus. The possibility... <coughs> This is awesome. In fact, it's been called the most American city in America. They say if it booms or bombs in Columbus, it booms or bombs nationally. Talking with someone with a German last name? Tell her about Columbus's historic German village with the brick streets and the wonderful 1850s style little houses. It's bound to inspire stories of the old country. Your conversation partner's surname is Italian. Tell him Genoa, Italy is Columbus's sister city. Talking with an American history buff? Welcome to Six Pack Promise. Today's workout will require the following pieces of equipment. A physio ball. Physio ball reverse crunches for 30 seconds. Begin in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Possibilities continue. You suspect your conversation partner has an artistic bed? Oh, you throw out casually. Who wonders is the home of artist George Bellow? Columbusite prepare some tasty snacks for actors, even if you know nothing about them. Give them a goodie. Tell them you always have to say Columbus over. Ten seconds left. Columbus, Arkansas, Columbus, Georgia, Columbus, Indiana, Columbus, Kansas. Columbus, Kentucky, Columbus, Mississippi. Columbus, Bent knee windshield wipers for 60 seconds. Begin in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Columbus, Pennsylvania, Columbus, Texas, and Columbus, Wisconsin. That spreads the conversational possibilities to 15 other states. Remember, as a quotable notable once said, 
No man would listen to you talk if he didn't know it was his turn next. A postscript to the hellish experience I had with Columbus. Months later, I mentioned the trauma to my speaker friend from Columbus, Jeff. Jeff explained his house was really in a smaller town just minutes outside Columbus. 30 seconds left. Gehenna, Ohio. Gehenna means hell in Hebrew, he said, and then went on to explain why he thought ancient Hebrew historians were clairvoyant. Thanks, Jeff. I knew you'd never lay a naked city on any of your listeners. 16. How the 10 seconds left. And what do you do? Third only to death and taxes is the assurance a new acquaintance will soon show. Physio ball ball passes for 30 seconds. Begin in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. At the moment, these few defensive moves help you keep your Cracker Jack communicator credentials when asked the inevitable question. First, like never the naked city. Don't toss a short, trick answer in response to the actor's breathless inquiry. You leave the poor fish flopping on the deck when you just say your title. I'm Ten seconds left. An author, an astrophysicist. Have mercy so he or she doesn't feel like a nincompoop outsider after. Physio ball side plank drops for 30 seconds. Begin in five, four, three, two. One. Don't leave it to laymen to try to figure out what you really do. Flesh it out. Tell a little story your conversation partner can get a handle on. For example, if you're talking with a young mother, say, I'm an attorney. Our firm specializes in employment law. In fact, now I'm involved in a case where a company actually... Ten seconds left. ...extra maternity leave that was a medical necessity. A mother can relate to that. Talking with a business owner? Switch sides in five, four, three, two, one. Employer who is being sued by one of her staff for asking personal questions during the initial job interview. A business owner can relate to that. Technique number 16. Never the naked jaw. When asked the inevitable, and what do you do? You may think, I'm an economist, an educator, an engineer. Ten seconds left. To engender good conversation. However, to one who is not an economist, educator, or an engineer, you might as well be saying, 30 seconds rest. Pornographer, flush it out. Throw out some delicious facts about your job for new acquaintances to munch on. Otherwise, they'll soon excuse themselves. Preferring the snack back at the cheese tray. Painful memories of naked jaw flashes. I still harbor painful recollections. Ten seconds left. Confronted by naked jaw flashes. Like the time a fellow at a dinner party told me, I'm a nuclear scientist. My physio ball wall plant crunches for 60 seconds. Begin in five, four, three, two, one industrial abrasive and then pause waiting for me to be impressed physio ball wall plant crunches for 60 seconds begin in five four three two one we three sat in silence the rest of the meal just last month a new acquaintance brow i'm planning to teach tibetan buddhism at truckee meadows community college and then climbed up I knew less about Truckee Meadows than I did about Tibetan Buddhism. Whenever people ask you what you do, give them some mouth to ear resuscitation so they can catch their breath and say something. 17. How to introduce people like the 30 seconds left. It is important to help newly met through their first nervous moment. Susan, I'd like you to meet John Smith. John, this is Susan Jones. Duh, what do you expect John and Susan to say? Smith? Um, that's S-M-I-T-H? Ten seconds left. Uh, golly, Susan, well, now that's an interesting name. 
Nice try, forget it. Don't blame John or Susan for being less than... The view ball stirs for 30 seconds. Begin in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The cast down the line with no bait for people to sink their teeth into. Big winners may not talk a lot, but conversation never dies unwillingly in their midst. They make sure of it with techniques like never the naked introduction. When they introduce people, they buy an insurance policy on the conversation with a few simple add-ons. Ten seconds left. John has a wonderful bogey to put trip on last summer. John, this is Susan Smith. Susan is editor-in-chief of Shoestring Warning. Change directions in five, four, three, two, one. Or where the group went. It gives John an opening to discuss his love of writing, or of cooking, or of food. The conversation can then naturally expand to travel in general, life on boats, past vacations, favorite recipes, restaurants, budget, diet, magazines, editorial policy, to infinity. Ten seconds left. Mentioning someone's job during the introduction. Mention their hobby or even a talent. The other day at a gathering, the hostess is... Congratulations, you've completed today's workout. Gilbert. Gilbert's gift is sculpting. He makes beautiful life carvings. I remember thinking, hmm. Now that's a lovely way to introduce someone and induce conversation. Technique number 17. Never the naked introduction. When introducing people, don't throw out an unbaited hook and stand there grinning like a big clam, leaving the newly met to fly. Are you a real estate investor looking for deals? Then you're going to love this free software that finds cheap houses for you. Hi, I'm Dr. Adam Fields. We've rolled out your iliotibial bands, and now we're going to do some strengthening. Let's go ahead and bring your foam roller under your knees, feet about hip distance apart. I want you to straighten your right leg as hard as you can. Just straighten it, straighten it, straighten it. Toes back towards you. We're going to hold this for 30 seconds as hard as you possibly can. Now, I want you to push your leg down a little bit into the foam roller as that leg is totally engaged, right? It has to be contracted as hard as you can to get the actual point of this exercise. The glute is going to be engaged a little bit because your leg is pushing down into that foam roller. Good. Just push it hard, 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 hard. Good. Now let's go ahead and switch to the other side. Straight your left leg as hard as you can. Push your legs down into that foam roller. Engage the, the adductor, the inner thigh, just a little bit. Everything's <laughs> engaging here, right? This is just all engagement. It's that last five degrees of the range of motion that we really want to be working here. That, that end uses an isometric contraction. You won't hurt yourself if it does hurt. If you feel any pain, just stop. But I think you're going to be fine here. Let's go to the other side, and let's go ahead and straighten the leg as hard as you can. And we're going to do some circles with the ankle, but still keep that leg straight. So circle, beautiful. Straighten that leg as hard as you can. Do not let that straightening let up. You're doing great. Let's go ahead the other direction. Beautiful. <laughs> Woo! Feeling it. Good. Let's go with the other leg. Straighten it as hard as you can. And circles. Circles. It's keeping that coordination going while you're engaging the leg. Let's go the other direction now, as hard as you can. Pull the shoulders down, chest is up, big breath. Good, beautiful. And let's straighten our right leg again. And this time we're gonna point to the end range motion so you feel the calf engage, but your leg is totally straight. And then extend and bring the toe up towards your head. Good, now toes pointed. And back. That leg is so, it's like a board, really. And back towards you. Beautiful. You're doing great. And let's switch to the other side. Straighten. 
as hard as you can. I want you to be straightening so hard that you're out and keep pointing and extending this foot that you're just shaking. I want you to shake like a leaf, right? Just go for it. Engage the inner thigh a little bit. So you're almost like you're sliding your leg towards the other leg and pointing and bringing it back towards you. Pointing back towards you. Beautiful. Chest is up. Okay, let's take the foam roller out and put it to your side. And we're gonna just stretch your hamstring. We're gonna stretch and we're gonna pull, okay? I want you to pull above the, or below the knee. We're gonna go to the other side and push that low back into the ground. And we're just gonna stretch the hamstring. It's kind of an active stretch. Engage the abs, your head is off the mat. Beautiful. And push that low back into the ground as hard as you can. Don't want to arch that low back here. Good job. Keep going. Beautiful. Breathing out as you pull. Good. Okay, we're gonna do a little bridge. I want you to pull those heels as close as you can towards your butt. Arch your low back a little bit. Now, with this, it's nice to protect the knees a little bit if you squeeze the foam roller in between your knees. Lift the toes and lift those, that, those hips off the ground and feel your glutes. Are they rock hard? Yes, great. Are the hamstrings relaxed? Great. So let's do a couple pulses here. Pulse it. Push, push the legs straight down to the ground like your tibia are just vertical and they're going directly into the ground and the hips are coming up. Beautiful. Squeeze that roller. Squeeze it. Squeeze it. Good. Let's keep going. Ten. Nine. Feel the glutes engage. Good. Put the roller down. Straighten your right leg. Let it flare out a little bit. And now I want you to straighten that leg as hard as you can and we're going to bring it up and twist it so that when you get to the knee, the toe is pointed pretty much straight up. So then you bring it out like a windshield wiper and back up. Engage the abs. Don't let them let up. We're going to be feeling this hopefully vastus medialis obliquus right there, that lower muscle and your inner thigh a bit. But if you straighten as hard as you can, you're going to be more DMO. There you go. Toe back towards you. <coughs> this should be challenging. And then set your leg down close to the hip. And then we're going to straighten the other leg. We're going to lift it and bring it up to meet the knee. Not above the knee, but to the knee. Great. This is solid knee rehabilitation stuff. Great prep if you want to do squats or something intense, even if you don't have a knee problem. This is a great warm up. Really get your knee tracking right, get the proper muscles engaging, getting that patella tracking properly, and really get your knee on track. Here we go, straighten that leg as hard as you can. Windshield wiper that leg. Okay, we're going to do the bridges again. Heels really close to the butt. Roller in between the knees and lift. Okay, this time we're going to do isometric contraction. You're going to squeeze that roller as hard as you can. And what we're going to do is you're going to lift your right leg and push down with your left leg. Now, before we do that, I want to tell you, if, if this is too much, just go back to this position, keeping the hips up. Don't drop your hips at all the entire, we're going to go a minute and a half. Okay, so go ahead and just lift, chest is up, arch the low back. Good. Straighten the leg that's up and push down with the leg that's bent. Feel that hamstring should be relaxed. So all the weight should be going right into the glute. You should be shaking a little bit. This is a little bit of a challenge. Arch that low back. Push your scapula into the ground, straighten the non 
<laughs> leg on the ground, push. Push those hips up towards the ceiling. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and switch. And straighten the opposite leg. Chest is up. How are we doing? Arch that low back. Squeeze the knees together. Chest is up. Lift those hips up towards the ceiling. Focus. Straighten this leg as hard as you can and push the other leg straight down into the ground. Ten more seconds. You're doing great. Big breath. Gonna go ahead and just put the roller aside. And we're gonna do some lifts again. This time the leg's straight. So the foot is gonna be going straight up to the ceiling and down again. The leg completely contracted. Contract that leg and lift. Keep the low back pushed into the ground. Your foot might want to flare as you go down to the bottom, but keep it centered and straighten the leg as hard as you can. I say that so much on this one. It's so important because we want to work more your leg than we do your hip flexor on this. Five more. Or if you need to rest now, rest. Either do them perfect or don't do them. And Plant that foot, let's go to the other side, and lift, beautiful. Straighten that leg, every rep would rock, remind it straighter. Four more, one, good job. Two, three, one more, four. Good, let's go ahead and do another bridge. Hips real close to your heels, lift up. We're gonna do that single leg bridge again. Lift the right leg, chest is up, pushing down with the left leg, straighten the right leg, good. You can do hands up, get a little bit more out of it. Arch up onto your shoulders, Good, straighten that right leg, push that left leg down. Push, 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 push. You're gonna be shaking right now, that's a good thing. Ten seconds. And let's go ahead and Drop that foot, lift the other, and push up. Proud posture, chest is up, shoulders down, arms are straight. Everything, you're like a stiff soldier doing it. Navy SEAL, right here, pushing through it, never giving up. Re-engage re that glute, get acquainted with that glute. Learn what it does, learn how to make it work for you. Push down. Into the ground with that heel hard. There you go. Straighten the left leg. Beautiful. Okay, we're going to go on our side. Okay, go on your side. Face me. Top leg is going to go here or here. Okay. Bottom leg is just going to straighten. And lift and hold. And down. Lift and hold. Lift and hold. Good. Lift and hold. Again, you're working that VMO. Lift and hold. Good job. Woo! It's a good one. Okay, and pulses now at the top. 40 of them.
Yeah. And let's bring your legs together 90 degrees. And we're gonna do some clams. So stack the hips, open up the legs, and squeeze at the top. Open up the legs, squeeze at the top. Good. Open, squeeze. Engage the abs. Let's get your body used to engaging your abs. Perfect. again and let's lift and hold and down lift hold you can get a little internal external rotation so you bring it down externally rotate your leg a little bit and internally rotate it as you bring it up to the top and pause at the top breathe out on the way out and pulses Good, very good. Okay, let's just do side lifts. Okay, we're just gonna lift the leg and bring it down. Good. Lift the leg and bring it down. Lift and bring it. Good job. Keep that toe pointed straight ahead. Good. Now we're gonna do with the toe pointed out. Straighten that leg. Good job. And let's head over to the other side. Okay, we're gonna do those side lifts again. Feet flat on the ground. We're just gonna lift, lift, lift. There we go. Lift and hold. Lift and hold. Good job. Lift and hold. Straighten that leg as hard as you can, people. <laughs> there we go. And now we're gonna pulse. Pulse it. Engage the abs. One more. Ten. And let's do some clams. 90 degrees and open. Open. You got it. Chest is up. Engage the abs. Open and squeeze them open. Open, squeeze them open. Have the best, best glutes in town. Work your glutes. The glutes are your friend. Two more. Push it and hold at the end. Good. One more. Push it, hold at the end. Let's go inside and let's go. Lift it up and hold. Rotate out, rotate in. Do a little external, internal rotation on this. There it is. And then just push and pulse it. Pulse, pulse, pulse. Oh, good. Now we're going to do side lifts. And we're just going to do toe pointing straight ahead. And lift and hold. And bring it down. Lift and hold. Bring it down. Engage those abs. Chest is up like a ballet dancer. There it is. Horizontal ballet. <laughs> okay. Now 
going to sweep the tail up towards the ceiling and up and down. Up. There you go. Up. Good. Okay, internal. Again, let's work those inner thighs and that BMO. Put that foot down, straighten that leg, and lift and hold, and down. Lift and hold, down, straighten the legs as hard as you can. Breathing out on the way up. Squeeze it, that tear drop, drop muscle. Visualize it in your head, see it. See it fibrous, see it big. See it working for you. See it going down the ski slope. See it on your mountain bike. See it absolutely functioning. Big time as you straighten that leg as hard as you can and now pull. Good job. Okay, let's go ahead and stretch your hamstring a little bit. Pull that hamstring. And we're just going to bring the toe back towards you. Good. Feel that stretch. Really pull it. Point the toe. And back towards you. Point it. Back towards you. Keep going. Pull it into your body. Good. Cross that leg over the other knee. Reach your hand through in between your legs and to the outside of your leg. And just Pull that in, let's stretch that out, it's that really works so well. Good. Pull it back really good, doesn't it? Big, big hip stretch. You can even take your knee and push it up towards your chest and get it even further. Okay, let's stretch the opposite hamstring. Bring it up, pull it in. Good. Let's bring the toes back towards you and point them. Ooh, feel that nice stretch. We're cracking the ankle, perhaps. And bring it back towards you. Beautiful. Working it. You did a great job today. Keep doing these. Your knees are going to be loving it. Let's go ahead and cross it over. Big breath. As you breathe out, pull a little harder. Let's stretch the outside of those legs. Cross the one leg over the other and just stretch. Opposite side, and put that hand to the opposite side of the knee, bend it, turn the other way, and just pull that knee in, and really get that outer leg, that low back, everything to stretch. Oftentimes with the knees, the outer can get a little weaker, or they can get a little too tight. Usually it's too tight, and the legs go out, so we need to strengthen the inner thighs, so we're stretching the outers a little bit more. Good, breathe through that. Great job. While we're doing shockwave or rehab together, I want you doing these exercises every day, and then we're gonna get more complex movements. Thanks for being here today for your strong knees.
their fins and fish for a topic. Bait the conversational hook to get them in the swim of things. Then you are free to stay or float on to the next networking opportunity. Armed with these two personality enhancers, three conversation igniters, and three small extenders, it is time to take a step up the communications ladder. Let us now rise from small talk and seek the path to more meaningful dialogue. The next technique is guaranteed to make the exchange engrossing for your conversation partner. 18. How to resuscitate a dying conversation. <clears throat> Even a well-intentioned husband who might ask his wife while making love, is it good for you too, honey? Knows not to ask a colleague, is the conversation good for you too? Yet he wonders, we all do. With the following technique, set your mind at rest. You can definitely make the conversation hot for anyone with whom you speak. Like my prom date Donnie, you will miraculously find subjects to engross your listeners. Be a sleuth on their slips of the tongue. No matter how elusive the clue, Sherlock Holmes is confident he'll soon be staring right at it through his magnifying glass. Like the unerring detective, big winners know, no matter how elusive the clue, they'll find the right topic. How? They become word detectives. I have a young friend, Nancy, who works in a nursing home. Nancy cares deeply about the elderly, but often grumbles about how crotchety and laconic some of her patients are. She laments she has difficulty relating to them. Nancy told me about one especially cantankerous old woman named Mrs. Otis, whom she could never get to open up to her. One day, Nancy confided, right after all those rainstorms we had last week, just to make conversation, I remarked to Mrs. Otis, terrible storms we had last week, don't you think? Well, Nancy continued, Mrs. Otis practically jumped down my throat. She said in a snippy voice, it's been good for the plants. I asked Nancy how she responded to that. What could I say? Nancy answered. The woman was obviously cutting me off. Did you ever think to ask Mrs. Otis if she liked plants? Plants? Nancy asked. Well, yes, I suggested. Mrs. Otis brought the subject up. I asked Nancy to do me a favor. Ask her, I begged. Nancy resisted, but I persisted. Just to quiet me down, Nancy promised to ask cantankerous old Mrs. Otis if she liked plants. The next day, a flabbergasted Nancy called me from work. Leo, how did you know? Not only did Mrs. Otis love plants, but she told me she'd been married to a gardener. Today, I had a different problem with Mrs. Otis. I couldn't shut her up. She went on and on about her garden, her husband. Top communicators know ideas don't come out of nowhere. If Mrs. Otis thought to bring up plants, then she must have some relationship with them. Furthermore, by mentioning the word, it meant subconsciously she wanted to talk about plants. Suppose, for example, instead of responding to Nancy's comment about the rain with, it's good for the plants, Mrs. Otis had said, because of the rain, my dog couldn't go out. Nancy could then ask about her dog. Or suppose she grumbled, it's bad for my arthritis. Can you guess what old Mrs. Otis wants to talk about now? When talking with anyone, keep your ears open and, like a good detective, listen for clues. Be on the lookout for any unusual references, any anomaly, deviation, digression, or invocation of another place, time, person. Ask about it because it's the clue to what your conversation partner would really enjoy discussing. If two people have something in common, when the shared interest comes up, they jump on it naturally. For example, if someone mentions playing squash, bird watching, or stamp collecting, and the listener shares that passion, he or she pipes up, Oh, you're a squasher, or birder, or philatelist, too. Here's the trick. There's no need to be a squasher, birder, or philatelist to pipe up with enthusiasm. You can simply be a word detective. 
When you pick up on the reference as though it excites you too, it parlays you into conversations a stranger thrills to. The subject may put your feet to sleep, but that's another story. Technique number 18. Be a word detective. Like a good gumshoe, listen to your conversation partner's every word for clues to his or her preferred topic. The evidence is bound to slip out. Then spring on that subject like a sleuth onto a slip of the tongue. Like Sherlock Holmes, you have the clue to the subject that's hot for the other person. Now that you've ignited stimulating conversation, let's explore a technique to keep it hot. 19. How to enthrall them with your choice of topic, them. Several years ago, a girlfriend and I attended a party saturated with a hodgepodge of slogan folks. Everyone we talked to seemed to lead a nifty life. Discussing the party afterward, I asked my friend, Diane, of all the exciting people at the party, who did you enjoy talking to most? Without hesitation, she said, Oh, by far, Dan Smith. What does Dan do? I asked her. Um, I'm not sure, she answered. Where does he live? Uh, I don't know, Diane responded. Well, what is he interested in? Well, we really didn't talk about his interests. Diane, I asked, what did you talk about? Well, I guess we talked mostly about me. Aha, uh -huh, I thought. Diane has just rubbed noses with a winner. As it turns out, I had the pleasure of meeting big winner Dan several months later. Diane's ignorance about his life piqued my curiosity, so I grilled him for details. As it turns out, Dan lives in Paris, has a beach home in the south of France, and a mountain home in the Alps. He travels around the world producing sound and light shows for pyramids and ancient ruins. And he is an avid hang glider and scuba diver. Does this man have an interesting life or what? Yet Dan, when meeting Diane, said nothing about himself. I told Dan about how pleased Diane was to meet him, yet how little she learned about his life. Dan simply replied, Well, when I meet someone, I learn so much more if I ask about their life. I always try to turn the spotlight on the other person. Truly confident people often do this. They know they grow more by listening than talking. Obviously, they also captivate the talker. Sell yourself with a top sales technique. Several months ago at a speaker's convention, I was talking with a colleague, Brian Tracy. Brian does a brilliant job of training top salespeople. He tells his students of a giant spotlight that when shining on their product, if not as interesting to the prospect. When they shine the spotlight on the prospect, they make the sale. Salespeople, this technique is especially crucial for you. Keep your swiveling spotlight aimed away from you, only lightly on your product, and most brightly on your buyer. You'll do a much better job of selling yourself and your product. Technique number 19, the swiveling spotlight. When you meet someone, imagine a giant revolving spotlight between you. When you're talking, the spotlight is on you. When the new person is speaking, it's shining on him or her. If you shine it brightly enough, the stranger will be blinded to the fact that you have hardly said a word about yourself. The longer you keep it shining away from you, the more interesting he or she finds you. 20. How to never need to wonder, what do I see next? Moments arise, of course, when even conversationalists extraordinaire hit the wall. Some folks' monosyllabic grunts leave slim pickings even for masters of the via word detective technique. If you find yourself futilely fanning the embers of a dying conversation, and if you feel for political reasons or human compassion that the conversation should continue, Here's a foolproof trick to get the fire blazing again. I call it parroting, after that beautiful tropical bird that captures everyone's heart simply by repeating other people's words. Have you ever, puttering around the house, had the TV in the background tuned to a tennis game? 
You hear the ball going back and forth over the net. Chink twunk, chink twunk, chink. This time you don't hear the clunk. The ball didn't hit the court. What happened? You immediately look up at the set. Likewise, in conversation, the conversational ball goes back and forth. First you speak, then your partner speaks, you speak, and so it goes back and forth. Each time through a series of nods and comforting grunts like mm-hmm or hmm, you let your conversation partner know the ball has landed in your court. It's your I got it signal. Such is the rhythm of conversation. What do I say next? Back to that frightfully familiar moment when it is your turn to speak, but your mind goes blank. Don't panic. Instead of signaling verbally or non-verbally that you've got it, simply repeat or parrot the last two or three words your companion said in a sympathetic, questioning tone. That throws the conversational ball right back in your partner's court. My friend Phil sometimes picks me up at the airport. Usually I am so exhausted that I rudely fall asleep in the passenger seat, relegating Phil to nothing more than a chauffeur. After one especially exhausting trip some years ago, I flung my bags in his trunk and flopped onto the front seat. As I was dozing off, he mentioned he'd gone to the theater the night before. Usually, I would have just grunted and walked it into unconsciousness. However, on this particular trip, I had learned the parroting technique and was eager to try it. Theater? I parroted quizzically. Yes, it was a great show. He replied, fully expecting it to be the last word on the subject before I fell into my usual sleepy stupor. Great show, I parroted. Pleasantly surprised by my interest, he said. Yes, it's a new show by Stephen Sondheim called Sweeney Todd. Sweeney Todd? I again parroted. Now Phil was getting fired up. Yeah, great music and an unbelievably bizarre story. Is our story? I parroted. Well, that's all Phil needed. For the next half an hour, Phil told me the show's story about a London barber who went around murdering people. I half dozed, but soon decided his tale of Sweeney Todd cutting off people's heads was disturbing my sleepy reverie. So I simply backed up and parroted one of his previous phrases to get him on another track. You said it had great music? That did the trick. For the rest of the 45-minute trip to my home, Phil sang me Pretty Women, The Best Pies in London, and other songs from Sweeney Todd. Much better accompaniment for my Demi Nap. I'm sure to this day, Phil thinks of that trip as one of the best conversations we ever had. And all I did was parrot a few of his phrases. Technique number 20, parroting. Never be left speechless again. Like a parrot, simply repeat the last few words your conversation partner says. That puts the ball right back in his or her court, and then all you need to do is listen. Salespeople, why go on a wild goose chase for a customer's real objections when it's so easy to shake them out of the trees with parroting? Parroting your way to profit. Parroting is also a can opener to pry open people's real feelings. Star salespeople use it to get to their prospects' emotional objections, which they often don't even articulate to themselves. A friend of mine, Paul, a used car salesman, told me he credits a recent sale of a Lamborghini to parody. Paul was walking around the lot with a prospect and his wife, who had expressed interest in a sensible car. He was showing them every sensible Chevy and Ford on the lot. Mm -hmm. As they were looking at one very sensible family car, Paul asked the husband what he thought of it. Well, he mused, I'm not sure this car is right for me. Instead of moving on to the next sensible car, Paul parroted, right for you? Paul's questioning inflection signaled the prospect that he needed to say more. Well, yeah, the prospect mumbled. I'm not sure it fits my personality. It's your personality? Paul again parroted. You know, maybe I need something a little more sporty. 
a little more blurry. Small penalty. Well, those cars over there look a little more sporty. Aha. Paul's parents had ferreted out which cars to show the customer. As they walked over toward a Lamborghini on the lot, Paul saw the prospect's eyes light up. An hour later, Paul had pocketed a fat commission. Want to take a rest from talking to save your throat? This next technique gets your conversation partner off and running, so all you have to do is listen. Or even sneak off unnoticed as he or she chats congenially away. 21. How to get them happily chatting, so you can slip away if you want to. Every father smiles when his little tyke beseeches him at bedtime. Daddy, Daddy, tell me the story again of the three little pigs. Or the dancing princesses, or how you and mommy met. Daddy knows Junior enjoyed the story so much the first time he wants to hear it again and again. Junior inspires the following technique called Encore, which serves two purposes. Encore makes a colleague feel like a happy dad, and it's a great way to give dying conversation a heart transplant. I once worked on a ship that had Italian officers and mostly American passengers. Each week, the deck officers were required to attend the captain's cocktail party. After the captain's address in charmingly broken English, the officers invariably clumped together, yakking it up in Italian. Needless to say, most of the passengers' grasp of Italian ended at macaroni, spaghetti, salami, and pizza. As cruise director, it fell on my shoulders to get the officers to mingle with the passengers. My not-so-subtle tactic was to grab one of the officer's arms and literally drag him over to a smiling throng of expectant passengers. I would then introduce the officer and pray that either the cat would release his tongue or a passenger would come up with a more original question than, gee, if all you officers are here, who is driving the boat? Never happened. I dreaded the weekly captain's cocktail party. One night, sleeping in my cabin, I was awakened by the ship rocking violently from side to side. I listened, and the engines were off. A bad sign. I grabbed my robe and raced up to the deck. Through the dense fog, I could barely discern another ship not half a mile from us. Five or six officers were grasping the starboard guardrail and leaning overboard. I rushed over just in time to see a man in the moonlight with a bandage over one eye struggling up our violently rocking ladder. The officers immediately whisked him off to our ship's hospital. The engines started again, and we were on our way. The next morning, I got the full story. A laborer on the other ship, a freighter, had been drilling a hole in an engine cylinder. While he was working, a sharp, needle-thin piece of metal shot like a missile into his right eye. The freighter had no doctor on board, so the ship broadcast an emergency signal. International sea laws dictate that any ship hearing a distress signal must respond. Our ship came to the rescue, and the seaman, touching his bleeding eye, was lowered into a lifeboat that brought him to our ship. Dr. Rossi, our ship's doctor, was successfully able to remove the needle from the workman's eye, thus saving his eyesight. Tell him about the time you... Cut to the next captain's cocktail party. Once again, I was faced with the familiar challenge of getting officers to mingle and make small talk with the passengers. I made my weekly trip to the laconic officers throng to drive one or two away and, this time, my hand fell on the arm of the ship's doctor. I hauled him over to the nearest group of grinning passengers and introduced him. I then said, just last week, Dr. Rossi saved the eyesight of a seaman on another ship after a dramatic midnight rescue. Dr. Rossi, I'm sure these folks would love to hear about it. It was like a magic wand. To my amazement, it was as though Dr. Rossi was blessed instantly with the tongues of angels. His previously monosyllabic broken English became thickly accented eloquence. He recounted the entire story for the growing group of passengers gathering around him. I left the throng that Dr. Rossi enraptured to pull another officer over to an awaiting audience. 
I grab the captain's strike-covered arm, drag him over to another pack of smiling passengers, and said, Captain Cafiero, why don't you tell these folks about the dramatic midnight rescue you made last week? The cat released Cafiero's tongue, and he was off and running. Back to the throng to get the first officer for the next group. By now, I knew I had a winner. Senor Silvato, why don't you tell these folks how you awakened the captain at midnight last week for the dramatic midnight rescue? By then, it was time to go back to extract the ship's doctor from the first bevy and take him to his next pack of passengers. It worked even better the second time. He happily commenced his encore for the second audience. As he chatted away, I raced back to the captain to pull him away for a second telling with another throng. I felt like the circus juggler who keeps all the plates spinning on sticks. Just as I got one conversation spinning, I had to race back to the first speaker to give him a whirl at another audience. The captain's cocktail parties were a breeze for me for the rest of the season. The three officers loved telling the same story of their heroism to new people every cruise. The only problem was I noticed the stories getting longer and more elaborate each time. I had to adjust my timing in getting them to do a repeat performance for the next audience. Play it again, Sam. Encore is what appreciative audiences chant when they want another song from the singer, another dance from the dancer, another poem from the poet, and in my case, another story poem from the officer. Encore is the technique you can use to request a repeat story from a prospect, potential employer, or valued acquaintance. While the two of you are chatting with a group of people, simply turn to him and say, John, I bet everyone would love to hear about the time you caught that 30-pound striped bass. Or, Susan, tell everyone that story you just told me of how you rescued the kitten from the tree. He or she will, of course, demur. Insist. Your conversation partner is secretly loving it. The subtext of your request is, that story of yours was so terrific, I want my other friends to hear it. After all, only crowd pleasers are asked to do an encore. Technique number 21, encore. The sweetest sound a performer can hear welling up out of the applause is encore, encore. Let's hear it again. The sweetest sound your conversation partner can hear from your lips when you're talking with a group of people is, tell them about the time you Whenever you're at a meeting or party with someone important to you, think of some stories he or she told you. Choose an appropriate one from their repertoire that the crowd will enjoy. Then shine the spotlight by requesting a repeat performance. The added benefit of this technique is that once you've got them up and running with their conversation, you can sneak off and find more interesting company. One word of warning. Make sure the story you request is one in which the teller shines. No one wants to retell the time they lost the sail, cracked up the car, or broke up the bar and spent the night in jail. Make sure your requested encore is a positive story where they come out the big winner, not the buffoon. The full beauty of this technique will hit you like a happy thunderbolt the first time you use it with someone who is telling a long and wearisome tale. You simply tiptoe away and let the board spin the story on and on with your friend. Of course, your friend may never speak to you again, but that's not germane to this chapter. The next technique deals with sharing some positive stories of your life. 22. How to come across as a positive person. Often people think when they meet someone they like, they should share a secret reveal an intimacy, or make a confession of sorts to show they are human too. Airing your youthful battle with bedwetting, teeth grinding, or thumb sucking, or your present struggle with gout or goiter, supposedly endears you to the masses. Well, sometimes it does. One study shows that if someone is above you in stature, their revealing a foible brings them closer to you. The whole of presidential candidate Adlai Stevenson's shoes charmed the nation, 
as did George H.W. Bush's shocking admission that he couldn't sum it properly. If you're on sure footing, say a superstar who wants to become friends with a fan, go ahead and tell your devotees about the time you were out of work and penniless. But if you're not a superstar, better play it safe and keep the skeletons in the closet until later. People don't know you well enough to put your foible in context. Later in a relationship, telling your new friend you've been thrice married, you got caught shoplifting as a teenager, and you got turned down for a big job may be no big deal. And that may be the extent of what could be construed as black mark on an otherwise flawless life of solid relationships, no misdemeanors, and an impressive professional record. But very early in a relationship, the instinctive reaction is, what else is coming? If he shares that with me so quickly, what else is he hiding? A closet full of ex-spouses? A criminal record? Walls papered with rejection letters? Your new acquaintance has no way of knowing your confession was a generous act, a well-intentioned revelation on your part. Technique number 22. Accentuate the positive. When first meeting someone, lock your closet door and save your skeletons for later. You and your new good friend can invite the skeletons out, have a good laugh and dance over their bones later in the relationship. But now's the time, as the old song says, to accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative. So far in this section, you have found assertive methods for meeting people and mastering small talk. The next is both an assertive and defensive move to help spare you that pasty smile we tend to sport when we have no idea what people are talking about. 23. How to always have something interesting to say. You've heard folks whine, I can't go to the party, I haven't got a thing to wear. When was the last time you heard, I can't go to the party, I haven't got a thing to say? When going to a gathering with great networking possibilities, you naturally plan your outfit and make sure your shoes will match. And of course, you must have just the right tie or correct color lipstick. You puff your hair, pack your business card, and you're off. Whoa, wait a minute. Didn't you forget the most important thing? What about the right conversation to enhance your image? Are you actually going to say anything that comes to mind or doesn't at the moment? You wouldn't don the first outfit your groping hand hits in the darkened closet. So you shouldn't leave your conversing to the first thought that comes to mind when facing a group of expectant, smiling faces. You will, of course, follow your instincts in conversation, but at least be prepared in case inspiration doesn't hit. The best way to ensure you're conversationally in the swing of things is to listen to a newscast just before you leave. What's happening right now in the world? All the fires, floods, air disasters, toppled governments, and stock market crashes pulverizes into great conversational fodder, no matter what crowd you're circulating in. It is with some embarrassment that I must attribute the following technique to a businesswoman in the world's oldest profession. For a magazine article I was writing, I interviewed one of the savviest operators in her field, Sydney Biddle Barrows, the famed Mayflower Madam. Sydney told me she had a house rule when she was in business. All of her female independent contractors were directed to keep up with the daily news so they could be good conversationalists with their clients. This was not just Sydney's point. Feedback from her employees had revealed that 60% of her girls' work hour was spent in chatting and only 40% in satisfying the customer's needs. Thus, she instructed them to read the daily newspaper or listen to a radio broadcast before leaving for an appointment. Sydney told me when she initiated this rule, her business increased significantly. Reports came back from her clients complimenting her on the fascinating women she had working for her. The consummate businesswoman, Ms. Barrows always strove to exceed her customers' expectations. Technique number 23, the latest news. Don't leave home without it. 
the last move to make before leaving for the party, even after you've given yourself final approval in the mirror, is to turn on the radio news or scan your newspaper. Anything that happened today is good material. Knowing the big deal news of the moment is also a defensive move that rescues you from putting your foot in your mouth by asking what everybody's talking about. Foot in mouth is not very tasty in public, especially when it's surrounded by egg on face. Ready for the big leagues of conversation? Let's go. Part three, how to talk like a VIP. Welcome to the human jungle. When two tigers prowling through the jungle chance upon one another in a clearing, they look at each other. They freeze. Instinctively, they calculate. If our staring came to hitting, came to scratching, came to clawing, who would win? Which of us has the stronger survival skills? Tigers in the wilderness differ little from the urban upright animals inhabiting the corporate jungle or single jungle, or social jungle. Humans start the process by looking at each other and talking. In the business world, while smiling and uttering, how do you do, hello, howdy, or hi, they are, like tigers, instinctively, instantaneously, sizing each other up. They're not calculating the length of each other's claws or the sharpness of their teeth. They are judging each other on a weapon far more powerful to survival as they have defined it. Humans are judging each other's communication skills. Although they may not know the names of the specific studies first proving it, they sense the truth. 85% of one's success in life is directly due to communication skills. They may not be familiar with the U.S. Census Bureau's recent survey showing employers choose candidates with good communication skills and attitudes way over education, experience, and training. But they know communication skills get people to the top. Thus, by observing each other carefully during casual conversing, it becomes almost immediately evident to both which is the bigger cat in the human jungle. It doesn't take long for people to recognize who is an important person. One cliche, one insensitive remark, one over-anxious reaction, and you can be professionally or personally demoted. You can lose a potentially important friendship or business contact. One stupid move and you can tumble off the corporate or social ladder. The techniques in this section will help ensure that you make all the right moves so this doesn't happen. The following communication skills give you a leg up to start your ascent to the top of any ladder you choose. 24. How to find out what they do without even asking. To size each other up, the first question little cats flat pawedly ask each other is, and what do you do, hmm? Then they crouch there, quivering their whiskers and twitching their noses with an obvious, I'm going to pronounce silent judgment on you after you answer, look on their pusses. Big cats never ask outright, what do you do? Oh, they find out all right, in a much more subtle manner. By not asking the question, the big boys and big girls come across as more principled, even spiritual. After all, their silence says, a man or a woman is far more than his or her job. Resisting the tempting question also shows their sensitivity. With so much downsizing, right-sizing, and capsizing of corporations these days, the blunt interrogation evokes uneasiness. The job question is not just unpleasant for those who are between engagements. I have several gainfully employed friends who hate being asked, and what do you do? One of these folks cuts cadavers for autopsy, the other is an IRS collection agent. Additionally, millions of talented and accomplished women have chosen to devote themselves to motherhood. When the cruel corporate question is thrust at them, they feel guilty. The rude interrogation belittles their commitment to their families. No matter how the women answer, they fear the asker is only going to hear a humble, I'm just a housewife. Big boys and big girls should avoid asking, what do you do, for another reason. 
Their abstinence from the question leads listeners to believe that they are in the habit of soaring with a high Did everything you want to spot the Google Bill? Phone Google Gun? Or a massage gun? Yeah, street. I suspect they invited me as their token working class person. I noticed no one was asking anyone what they did, because these swells didn't do anything. Oh, some might have a ticker tape on the bed table of their mansion to track investments. But they definitely did not work for a living. The final benefit to not asking, what do you do, is it throws people off guard. It convinces them that you are enjoying their company for who they are, not for any crass networking reason. Technique number 24. What do you do not? A sure sign you're a somebody is the conspicuous absence of the question, what do you do? You determine this, of course, but not with those four dirty words that label you as either a ruthless networker, a social climber, a gold-digging husband or wife hunter, or someone who's never strolled along Easy Street. The right way to find out. So how do you find out what someone does for a living? I thought you'd never ask. You simply practice the following eight words. All together now. How do you spend most of your time? How do you spend most of your time is the gracious way to let a cadaver cutter, a tax collector, or a capsized employee off the hook. It's the way to reinforce an accomplished mother's choice. It's the way to assure a spiritual soul you see his or her inner beauty. It's a way to suggest to a swell that you reside on Easy Street too. Now, suppose you've just made the acquaintance of someone who does like to talk about his or her work. Asking, how do you spend most of your time, also opens the door for workaholics to spout off. Oh golly, they mock moan. I just spend all my time working. That, of course, is your invitation to grill them for details. Then they'll talk your ear off. Yet the new wording of your question gives those who are somewhere between at leisure and work addicted the choice of telling you about their job or not. Finally, asking, how do you spend most of your time instead of, and what do you do, gives you your big cat stripes right off. 25. How to know what to say when they ask, what do you do? Now, 99% of the people you meet will, of course, ask, and what do you do? Big winners, realizing someone will always ask, are fully prepared for the interrogation. Many folks have one written resume for job seeking. They type it up and then trudge off to the printer to get a nice, neat stack to send to all prospective employers. The resume lists their previous positions, dates of employment, and education. Then at the bottom, they might as well have scribbled, Well, that's me. Take it or leave it. <laughs> and usually, they get left. Why? Because prospective employers do not find enough specific points in the resume that relate directly to what their firm is seeking. Boys and girls in the big leagues, however, have bits and bytes of their entire work experience tucked away in their computers. When applying for a job, they punch up only the appropriate data and print it out so it looks like it just came from the printer. My friend Roberto was out of work last year. He applied for two positions, a sales manager of an ice cream company and head of strategic planning for a fast food chain. He did extensive research and found the ice cream company had deep sales difficulties, and the food chain had long-range international aspirations. Did he send the same resume to each? Absolutely not. His resume never deviated one iota from the truth of his background. However, for the ice cream company, he highlighted his experience turning a small company around by doubling its sales in three years. For the food chain, he underscored his experience working in Europe and his knowledge of foreign markets. Both firms offered Roberto the job. Now he could play them off against each other. He went to each, explaining he'd like to work for them, but another firm was offering a higher salary or more perks. 
The two firms started bidding against each other for Roberto. He finally chose the food chain at almost double the salary they originally offered him. To make the most of every encounter, personalize your verbal resume with just as much care as you would your written curriculum bite. Instead of having one answer to the omnipresent, what do you do? Prepare a dozen or so variations, depending on who's asking. For optimum networking, every time someone asks about your job, give a calculated oral resume in a nutshell. Before you submit your answer, consider what possible interest the asker could have in you and your work. Here's how my life can benefit yours. Top salespeople talk extensively of the benefit statement. They know when talking with a potential client, they should open their conversation with a benefit statement. When my colleague Brian makes cold calls, instead of saying, Hello, my name is Brian Tracy. I'm a sales trainer. He says, Hello, my name is Brian Tracy from the Institute for Executive Development. Would you be interested in a proven method that can increase your sales from 20 to 30% over the next 12 months? That is his benefit statement. He highlights the specific benefits of what he has to offer to his prospects. My hairdresser, Gloria, I discovered, gives a terrific benefit statement to everyone she meets. That's probably why she has so many clients. In fact, that's how she got me as a client. When I met Gloria at a convention, she told me she was a hairdresser who specialized in flexible hairstyles for the businesswoman. She casually mentioned she has many clients who choose a conservative hairstyle for work that they can instantly convert to a feminine style for social situations. Hey, that's me, I said to myself, fingering my stringy little ponytail. I asked for her card and Gloria became my hairdresser. Then, several months later, I happened to see Gloria at another event. I overheard her chatting with a stylish gray-haired woman at the buffet table. Gloria was saying, and we specialize in a wonderful array of blue rinses. Now that was news to me. I didn't remember seeing one gray head in her salon. As I was leaving the party, Gloria was out on the lawn talking animatedly with the host's teenage daughters. Oh yeah, she was saying. Like, we specialize in these really cool, up-to-the-minute styles. Good for you, Gloria. Like Gloria the hairdresser, give your response a once-over before answering the inevitable, what do you do? When someone asks, never give just a one-word answer. That's for forms. If business networking is on your mind, ask yourself, how could my professional experience benefit this person's life? For example, here are some descriptions various people might put on their tax returns. Real estate agent, financial planner, martial arts instructor, cosmetic surgeon, hairdresser. Hey, yo, we did, uh, did everything on that list this morning. Just under 90 minutes. Um, what's today, day 24 to 26? Yeah, so that was day 26 of the winter bulk at home workout. Today was a recovery day. Um, I hope y'all learned something from that book too. It's called uh, 92 Ways to Talk to Anyone. So, other than that, this is how we looking. It's this light over here. I'm trying to fix it. Let me see. Alright, Joe. Till tomorrow.